Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second Engager Training School. This time, the theme is Mainstreaming Innovative Energy Poverty Metrics. Um, I'll um, just introduce our um, anchors or trainers for the day. We have with us uh, Thomas uh, Schultzfeld, who's uh, joining from Trondheim, from NTNU. And uh, we have uh, Tor Hokon Inneberg, uh, who's joining us from uh, Oslo, from the Fridjof Nansen Institute. And uh, I'm Siddharth Sarin from the University of Stavanger. So we're spread out across uh, Norway today. And uh, um, there'll be a chance to do more sort of uh, um, pleasantries and uh, get to know each other a bit throughout the course of the week. But uh, we have allocated uh, in the first half hour 10 minutes to each of us. Um, so I'm going to not eat into more of mine um, and uh, take you to a few slides that are uh, I'm going to introduce this theme of energy poverty metrology and digitization for low carbon energy infrastructure. So you can see my slides, I hope. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and, and just to give an overview of the three things that we're going to talk about within this theme, um, I'll say, say a few words about energy poverty metrology, what that is, and, uh, and related to social spatial inclusion in digitization at the urban scale. And then Thomas will take us through some reflections about social inclusion in digital innovation for urban mobility. I'll also ease us into the mobility sector ahead of his talk. And then Tor Hockman will go into new dimensions of energy poverty, um, reflecting on evolving requirements for household electricity consumer flexibility. And all of that will, it's a lot to take on board. Um, and you might be wondering how it relates to energy poverty, but uh, hopefully all of that will be very clear um, very soon. So energy poverty metrology is the science of energy poverty metrics. You know this also from one of the readings assigned for this module. Um, and this is really about, and the next slide goes a bit more into detail on how to think about developing new metrics um, and using existing ones um, in order to capture energy poverty in a system that itself is changing. Um, and, and something I say in the bottom of the slide about digitization at the urban scale is that digitization is not only about real-time flows, it's connecting different sectors as well. So there's cross-sectoral integration, which is why um, in this module, we try to bring together a focus on electricity um, and digitization sort of at the household scale, as well as on transport, where that sector is increasingly electrified in order to decarbonize it. And uh, that means communicating and coordinating across these sectors. And all of this, the, the sort of main feature of focus here, which is also in the center of the slide, is on socio-spatial inclusion. So how do these shifts towards more digital infrastructure, towards systems that are more closely integrated into each other with real-time flows of information? Um, and uh, how does that actually impact the different kinds of users of these services, of electricity, of transport, in terms of access and allocation? And those things are very relevant, of course, to, um, to energy poverty, um, because that's, that's how we use energy in these different services. Now, just to take, take up um, uh, a key figure from that paper I mentioned on energy poverty metrology, um, we talk about three kinds, and several of the authors are, in fact, uh, um, part of the trainers for this um, um, training school. So you'll get a chance to uh, hear from, from several of us along the way. Um, there's five key dimensions of energy poverty metrology that we bring up here. And just to take sort of the, the three themes running through while thinking about it. The first is around historical trajectories. Um, and that helps us to consider what kind of metrics exist for energy poverty and why. Um, and partly this can be linked to existing infrastructures. You can only um, measure things that you can actually uh, capture um, through the infrastructure that you have in place. And of course, this can change. And then there's an aim to try to be as broad as possible to capture the entire range of activities while also trying to be very detailed and accurate in targeting. So we talk about this as data flattening and contextualized identification. Can metrics be both broad and deep? And there's of course a trade-off here. So it's, um, you know, a model is never as uh, um, detailed as the world, the, the kind of uh, phenomena it's uh, describing, but uh, you want to get as close as you can, realistically. 
And then finally, um, how does all of this translate into impact? How do these metrics drive real world change? And here we focus on new representation. That's also part of the theme of the training school, mainstreaming innovative energy poverty metrics and also policy uptake. So that's really capturing the mainstreaming part. So I thought I would um, um, give you a couple of examples from Stavanger um, since uh, we can't be here today. There's an autonomous bus. This runs around uh, the neighborhood. Um, right now you can see somebody in there training it. Um, so there's some amount of manual driving, but the idea is that this will be part of the future of mobility, that it's autonomous, super digitalized, hyper digitalized. Another photo you see is of uh, several um, E-scooters, uh, actually the guy getting into a car has set up the ones that are in green and uh, and I don't think he's kicked the other ones down, but uh, um, it's just to make the point that they take over public space in different ways. So it's a micro mobility solution. It's electricity based and it is quite popular, but it also poses some kinds of risks to, for instance, blind people or people with limited uh, mobility or even somebody who really likes walking around uh, neighborhood or cycling. Um, so I won't go into detail here, but I will bring up something that we will use in the exercise in a later part of this module in the next session. Um, just to relate uh, the ideas of what metrics exist and why um, to this context of Stavanger and the mobility sector here, um, we'll go into the climate and environmental plan for the city going up to 2030 and focus on the low carbon transport targets and indicators. So these are the concrete metrics that are in place and imagined to be relevant over the next decade in at the urban scale. And then thinking about whether these metrics can be broad and can be deep, I guess the questions to ask for uh, the transport sector would be, do the metrics, the targets, the indicators um, to see how far, we, how we perform on these targets for a transport transition, do they capture the range of mobility needs and address the equity aspects of mobility for multiple kinds of stakeholders. So how are benefits and burdens allocated? Is it uh, helping those who might choose low carbon solutions? Um, is it helping those who reduce the, the public space taken up by their mobility needs? And what is incentivized and not? That's something that we can actively consider. And finally, how do these metrics drive real world change? And of course, here we're interested in, in energy poverty, also in transport energy poverty, which comes up in a module later this week. So this is really about the policy impact, but also about transition politics as we shift from what is historically a very car centric city. Um, it's got very high rates of usage of cars and people rely on them to go out to their cabins on the weekends to get around. So there's not as much of a push for public transport historically, um, as in many other urban contexts of uh, about a quarter million people, which is what the city's population is. Um, and also a, a transition to new um, transport modalities um, and, and everything that goes into planning that. So um, just to kind of leave off um, here, I, I was struck by this image. It's just a couple of walks, uh, a couple of minutes walk uh, from home for me. That tunnel um, you see on the uh, slide to the left, uh, that's one that a lot of car traffic goes through. Um, there's uh, a differently directed cycle lanes. But here you have an ad for electric bikes by an electric bicycle company in town that says the new car has two wheels and it advertises a bicycle. And then just a week later, um, crossing over a bridge from which I took this uh, photo while walking my dog. Um, look at the second photo, which shows you that uh, that same advertising spot has been replaced by a car advertisement. So you could argue that here you see um, the not the politics of metrics, but the politics of the transition and of different views um, really manifesting themselves in the urban landscape. But of course, these are then reflected in metrics of what we envision the city to be, um, what kind of mobility is given public space it, to be part of the public imaginary of what transport is desirable for the future. And with that, I will stop sharing and hand over to Thomas, who will then lead us into um, another set of uh, things to think about. Thanks a lot. I'll uh, also just share my screen then and... Um... There we go. Uh, but I'll head on over here, show you all my backstage stuff. Sorry about that. 
Um, there we are. So, and uh, thanks a lot for uh, the invitation, Sid. And uh, thanks a lot for the nice uh, presentation, which I think eases very easily into some of the uh, things I'll address. And, uh, and I'll actually also mainly keep in Stavanger, uh, although I'm personally now based in, in, uh, in Trondheim. And I'll uh, zoom in a bit on these, I guess, hyper digital um, elements that Sid briefly mentioned. Um, you know, when I was kind of thinking about how to, to do this, um, there's a lot of potential topics to, to address. Uh, and um, uh, especially thinking about sort of digitization and uh, extending on that self-driving and all these kinds of things. There's a lot of hope, there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of ideas about how uh, these technologies and, uh, and uh, uh, tools will transform cities, transform the urban uh, uh, form, uh, but also kind of transform how we are mobile. So there's this, uh, on the one hand, huge ideas about um, ownership models of uh, cars ending and uh, everything being service oriented and uh, those kinds of ideas. Um, and actually then uh, a lot of these ideas about hopes are highly kind of um, focused on things such as inclusion and democratization. So there's kind of big ideals, uh, big ideas and ideals about how these technologies will enable uh, mobility amongst groups who are currently less mobile. So there's a lot of talk about the elderly here. And there's a lot of talk about disabled uh, groups. There's a lot of talk about how um, it will enable uh, the kind of democratization of uh, safety and so on and so forth. So, um, I mean, uh, with that as a kind of backdrop, I figured, uh, well, it, it maybe it makes sense to talk about self-driving and these kinds of things in this context. Um, and today, I guess a lot of the work to, to sort of implement and uh, test these uh, Technologies, they happen in, in these pilot and demonstration projects that Sid showed you an image of from Stavanger. Um, and uh, there's different ways to think about these developments. Um, so, Norcia Maris, I think quite nicely, she talks about this as being part of a broad push towards a kind of beta testing society where you, uh, where you very actively experiment with, with things that are. Uh, that can represent materializations uh, of existing visions for how future society should look. I mean, you can simply think of these projects as uh, kind of an element of a innovation process, um, but you can also think about them, you know, more as kind of mode of governance and as a side of steering and as a potential side of public engagement and, and politics and, and contestation and all of these things. So, um, and, and uh, within the transport fields, mobility fields, there is, I guess, a kind of potential, radical potential um, in these uh, kinds of, of, uh, of projects. So kind of to, to transform technology, but also to transform um, um, societies more broadly and uh, with a potential for kind of democratic inclusive mobility system. Um, and, and this means that they are sites of micropolitics and, I, I guess wherever there is micropolitics, uh, there's also uh, inclusionary and exclusionary uh, practices. So um, I guess this could be a way of, of uh, beginning to think about metrics here potentially, which isn't a big part of, of, of what I've been working with. But uh, so there's kind of discursive practices going on. So how do you frame problems? How are project pro problems presented, which kinds of competences are deemed necessary to take part in, uh, uh, in these kinds of projects, which kinds of skills are involved in, in formulating the agendas and, and the strategies that are, uh, that are employed here, and which kinds of practices of participation are mobilized. So where are these projects taking place? When are they taking place? how are they taking place? These are kind of things to think about. 
and then I thought I would I thought I would instead of kind of thinking too much about this in the abstract I'd give one example uh, and and the, this is from city's neighborhood I guess in in Stavanger uh, I thought I'd give a brief brief story about one project uh, and how the kind of politics of it has evolved um, the, the image you saw on the that slide is from uh, closed testing track yeah, at Forus. Uh, this project ha had a kind of two stage design uh, where you uh, initially had a kind of learning phase on a closed track uh, for a kind of self-driving vehicle. Um, but the interesting thing is that in this first, there's a lot to be said about the technology, but I, I won't go into that, but um, it had kind of two narratives at that stage one narrative which was um, let's say purely technological this is a trial intended to to learn uh, the potential perils of this technology but on the other hand uh, this closed trial uh, was explicitly kind of formulated as a way of engaging and producing future publics for this for this technology so they invited specific groups to this closed track, kindergartens, schools, uh, they invited the Association of the Disabled, uh, elderly groups, and all of these groups were kind of invited in, uh, especially to, to learn about this, to try to be persuaded about uh, this particular future of public transport. So that's a very brief story about uh, stage one here of this trial. Uh, it, it feeds kind of into some of the things that Sid talked about. Well, uh, there's something to be said about the social status of public transport here. So, you know, these groups, in one sense, this is inclusive, but it also feeds into the story of that we heard from our respondents that men in suits, they don't ride the bus in Stavanger. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, um, so it kind of feeds into potentially um, a story about uh, public transport being for specific groups, whereas kind of uh, cars and the rest of the automobility system being for the more high status oriented groups. So we, this first stage then uh, produces a question of, uh, is this kind of uh, something done to, to make a more inclusive system or does it reiterate kind of this, the old status of the car? The second stage provides some clues. I'm happy to see from Sid's photos, there's now also a third stage. But um, the, the second stage appeared on, on a public road. And uh, as, as they kind of went into this, you had these narratives, Sid mentioned this, you know, this is the future of public transport. It is last mile transportation. Uh, also kind of more inclusive transportation uh, is part of it. Um, to a certain extent, some actors frame this as being about a less car dependent automobility system, but that I think is a less clear, um, clear um, narrative. Um, it should be said that it's test it was tested in an extremely car oriented area, very few children there, very few uh, elderly, very few disabled, so that kind of also feeds into the story here. Um, very briefly, last minute of my, my 10 minutes here. Uh, this, this second stage illustrates, I guess, how uh, uh, this type of innovation might have different goals and uh, how that evolves over time. So in this case, it seemed to us at least that uh, there was a move from innovating <laughs> for the publics within the bus to innovating primarily to the publics that were outside of this bus. So as this trial started, there was a lot of work going on to redesign the material conditions of this area, actually to favor this bus. So you had stuff like speed bumps, you have lowered car, uh, speed limits, you had a lot of new signs, a lot of stuff kind of going into uh, to, to favor this bus. Um, as this project unfolded, um, it really became unpopular with the automotorists. It, uh, the innovation activities, in a sense, changed character, and it became more about ensuring that this thing was not as much as an annoying to the surroundings as uh, it was uh, 
um, a thing that could work for passengers. So then it was actually about slowly removing the speed bumps, increasing the speed and very actively kind of going away from the idea of self-driving and actively managing how this vehicle uh, interacted uh, with the cars. So um, it kind of illustrates, I guess, some generic challenges of this type of innovation. So how do you, uh, in this case, it seems to me that it, it really became about uh, putting something in traffic, which wasn't too much of an annoyance. Um, and through that, retelling re a story about cars being the central way of getting around in, in, in uh, Stavanger. So it, it asks, I guess, the question of what that means in terms of inclusion and uh, opens some questions about how to disrupt rather than strengthen the current cultures and system of uh, automobility. Um, and also then to balance kind of how do you cater for the potential publics of the future that you imagine uh, to use these kinds of radical new technologies versus kind of catering for the publics that are actually out there right now in, uh, in traffic. So I'll, uh, I've spent my 10 minutes, I'll stop there and uh, hand it over to Tour. Thank you uh, very much, Thomas. Um, just um, share my presentation here. Can you can you all see that? Excellent. Um, so this, um, um, I do not come from uh, the mobility side of things. I come from um, from uh, the more the electricity governance uh, aspect. So my background has been in political science, and. Um, uh, some of this work uh, has started from, from uh, through the INCLUDE Center, uh, Research Center for Socially Inclusive uh, Energy Transition. Um, so we'll keep doing this. It, this presentation will be partly focused on some developments in the energy or electricity sector in, in Norway and partly um, indicate some speculations about the uh, uh, possible developments for uh, vulnerable, vulnerable groups uh, in that regard. So first, I think um, since we're not all Norwegian, Norwegians here, I think we need a little bit of a Norway at a glance in terms of the electricity system. Um, so Norway generates about 153 terawatt hours electricity per year, and it's um, more or less fully renewable based uh, in based on hydropower um, so so the electricity sector is not really a focus on on um, for decarbonization transitions um, also some some interesting facts about Norway that make I hope this this makes this uh, presentation um, more relevant for for uh, those of you who are not Norway focused um, because I, th I I believe that some of these aspects may lead to some of the challenges being um, visible perhaps a little bit earlier in Norway than some other places. Um, it's a high rate, a high rate of home ownership in Norway compared to the European average. Um, and also quite strikingly, the um, use of electricity or the electri electrification of Norwegian households is uh, very high. It's more than, it's between two to three times as high as, uh, as the European average. So electricity is the main source of heating in 73% of Norwegian dwellings. And that's about, uh, it represents, uh, consumption, electricity consumption represents about 16,000 kilowatt hours units of electricity. This compares to about 4,000 annually in the UK for you, uh, British dwellings and, and about 10,000 for Sweden. You can see that the graph um, to the right where Norway represents the, the bar to the far right. Um, at just over 16,000 kilowatt hours. And you can see the rest of the EU uh, distributed out to the left. And, and you can see that, that, that this, um, this difference. So this means that, um, that Norway is in a, in a quite particular position when it comes to electricity use. And, and that means also that um, possibly marginalized groups might be uh, have additional uh, vulnerabilities uh, connected to, to uh, electricity prices. So although Norway has traditionally had quite low electricity prices, 
comparing mostly to, to Eastern Europe. Um, we do see that since it's so weather dependent, Norway is um, very hydropower based. It's, it's also precipitation based, and, and that means that prices can fluctuate. So of course, this has, this has implications for energy uh, poverty. So, but in, in all traditional metrics, um, Norway tends to score very low on energy poverty. Um, and also it has never been on the political agenda, really. It, it, it has shown up in the media sometimes and it's been, when it's been low, uh, dry, very dry years, um, but it, it hasn't really been a very, um, it hasn't been much of a focus either in research or in, in policy, I would, I would claim. Although there are some more recent investigations, so they, they correspond to a little bit with the more European focus in, in, in what causes, um, causes energy poverty. Um, but but some, the, the examples are, are mostly from qualitative uh, studies and, and focus on particularly actually on, on retirees and marginalized groups that we will uh, recognize from elsewhere. So what's 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 happening then in the in the in the Norwegian electricity system that that may lead to new kinds of uh, of challenges for for vulnerable groups? Um, we see that uh, the electricity system is is we have to keep that in mind. Um, I'm I'm sure you know, but it's it's um, it's uh, fundamental for for the for the point we are going to make here that the electricity system is based on simultaneous or continuous gen, uh, generation and consumption balance. So you have to produce as much as you use at the same, uh, at all times. So in Norway, this has, has been mainly taken care of by regulated hydropower. Norway is, uh, has about half of European combined um, storage for hydro hydropower. Uh, and this has offered a lot of flexibility in the system. Uh, this is changing now, with uh, particularly with increasing wind power. So wind power has gone from about uh, well, 99% hydropower, and now it's about 10% wind power in the system. And so this is changing the case and putting some strain on the system. Um, and also with the, with the um, uh, vulnerabilities of, the, of, of dry years in the Norwegian system, this, this, this has to be um, thought of as a background for this. And then there are different um, developments in, in, the, in the Norwegian system as, as elsewhere, of course. With the with the intermittency, we have the variable renewables that is challenging on the on the supply side. Uh, Norway has a quite weak grid with uh, with uh, nodes supplying and transporting electricity in a traditional way. But also there there has been significant developments on the on the consumer side and on, on the distribution grid uh, level. So uh, particularly with uh, with um, consumers moving uh, away from um, or, or having more intense use of, uh, of induction apparatuses and, and uh, simultaneous use of power demanding apparatuses. This is uh, actually uh, quite challenging for some of the grid utilities at the dis distribution grid level. And also with the very high electric vehicle rollout in Norway, um, uh, this, is, this is putting quite a bit of strain on the electricity system on the, on the distribution grid side. So we have this change in balance where it has been in previous years, it's been um, quite, uh, quite a well-functioning system in spite of a uh, reasonably weak grid. And this has been uh, taken care of by the hydropower flexibility. This is changing and, and, uh, and um, even if it's not acute in any way, it's it's certainly changing for the future. So, this means that um, that uh, the government is looking to find ways to balance this in a better way, together with the grid companies. There are some enabling factors uh, for this, um, and uh, and the primary one perhaps is the finalization of smart meter implementation in in, in Norway for all uh, meters. Um, so it's it's a full rollout, nationally governed, um, uh, and these meters they currently report and communicate to a central hub every hour, and this will um, in some time some time be every 15 minutes. So this is, enables grid tariffing, which is uh, which is uh, what I'm going to focus on here, which may may cause some 
uh, concern for vulnerable groups. This has been sent, um, further enabled by a central LHUB reporting unit and data hub. And here we see the coming regulation on capacity tariffing, which is, uh, which is uh, coming in the way. So the capacity tariff um, is intended to create an, an economic incentive making it uh, for, for grid use, uh, making it um, uh, feasible for, for, uh, for consumers to move the loads, the simultaneous use of electricity from peak hours to, to, to other times. Um, and so there has been determined there will be a power-based uh, grid tariff. Um, the, the concrete uh, uh, shape and design of it has been controversial. And it has been, uh, it is still under, it's, it's currently in the Ministry uh, of Energy uh, at the moment. Um, currently, it's, it's a uh, reasonably weak proposal, but there are good reasons to expect this to be strengthened and having a stronger impact for future, uh, in, in the future for, for uh, electricity consumers and, and ordinary households. So this can have some potentially, and this is where uh, I'm turning into a little bit more of the speculative uh, mode here, but it, it can have some significant implications for, for, uh, for consumers. Um, so those who can move their loads away from certain times uh, um, uh, may benefit uh, strongly from this when it becomes a little bit more uh, strong incentives. Um, but we do see that um, Users, while they do respond to power tariffs, it's also a great unexplained variability. Um, and some earlier qualitative studies has, has pointed to that affluent consumers uh, in detached houses are, are the, typically the most flexible ones, where the less affluent ones, um, they may uh, see the benefit by gaining some control from feedback, but, uh, but the, their living conditions have, uh, have been found to be um, difficult for them to, to, uh, to uh, move their loads. So they may live in uh, tight flats with strict rules and the infrastructure doesn't really enable them to, to move their loads. Um, so investment ability is also quite crucial for, or lack of, uh, for, for, for um, reaping the benefits of this. And this is creating, um, we, we see some tendencies already that this is creating some, some challenges. Um, I'll just skip along, I think, to the last um, uh, slide, but uh, mention that we, in terms of metrics that uh, you are looking for, so this, this can have a, a benefit that it's with um, uh, smart meters, it can partly be directly measured who are flexible, who at least who are, is uh, able to move and do move their loans from those who, who do not. Um, um, so in sum, uh, we see that the power-based tariffs may create some social challenges uh, to, um, and, and perhaps even create some new dimensions to uh, energy poverty. Um, they are likely, uh, I believe, to, to put some exacerbation uh, on the burdens of those already vulnerable to, uh, to energy poverty. Um, and there's that additional um, dimension of lack of uh, investment ability that that might might drive this even further. So since uh, in Norway it's been a very clear absence of social policies being included in the energy policies. Um, so um, we are looking into this and and uh, and and would like to investigate more about how this could what, what shape this could take. But we we are we are have some concerns that I've just briefly um, been through. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tor. Then we have uh, 10, 12 minutes for um, discussion and we're open for questions. Yeah, just go ahead, Miguel. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for your presentations. I was just thinking that regarding the the risks and um, the public space occupation of active mobility, such as the e-scooters and bicycles. This has become a quite uh, uh, politicized and polarized topic in Lisbon for now the, the elections. 
and um, I think it's yeah for sure the active mobility it also has dangers but we we cannot forget what really takes up all the space in the cities and uh, what really poses the dangers to the pedestrians so uh, I would ask you you three how do you see that these um, the these metrics could help people uh, better accept these new mobility modes in the in the cities. Thomas, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, it's a good question, and I recognize this uh, politicization of active mobility, and of course the. I guess uh, implicated the politicization of the space that cars basically already take up. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I, I um, in, in terms of metrics and how they could help uh, actualize that, I mean, you, I suppose you could create metrics that, uh, that say something about that. I mean, that is, that is not the type of discussion that we have uh, in the policy domain right now. Um, uh, you know, thinking about thinking actively about um, these uh, these mobility uh, uh, technologies and modes as occupiers of space. I mean, you could probably uh, uh, do fun uh, and interesting metrics around that, uh, which would open the door to a slightly different uh, discussion. You know, than uh, than we have today, which is a lot of it, in my uh, impression, based on uh, sort of uh, knee-jerk annoyance that many people have to, to these uh, new active uh, uh, modes of mobility. Uh, I don't have a super clear cut answer to how that might look in practice, but uh, it would be interesting to, to think about. Maybe I can add a quick thought. Uh, um... So uh, Howard has written about this, uh, the zero growth objective in, uh, in um, sort of federal policy in Norway in the mobility sector uh, limits uh, the total number of cars, an absolute number in the, the four major cities. And uh, it, it's a very simple metric in a way because it's uh, the number zero <laughs> that you're bound by that. But um, um, the argument there is interesting that often targets are um, you know, criticized for, oh, that's so ambitious. Will it just be a target? Um, will it actually lead to change? But if you have a target that's sort of really simple, um, then it can have intuitive appeal that's taken forward into then urban, what are called the urban growth agreements in, uh, in Norwegian cities. And so um, that's just a metric that came to mind. Um, Luca had a question, saw hand. Sir, hello, uh, thank you for the presentation and also for the question of the other guy, I don't remember the name. And then, um, actually I have two questions because one was introduced by a person in Lisbon. One is uh, the metrics of time, how it should be considered. Because, uh, well, especially in Lisbon, public transportation uh, can be not very efficient. And the second question is actually uh, even more complicated because we are all in uh, Europe, and, uh, and you're talking by a Norway perspective, and I'm not really sure how you can compare with Southern Europe for a number of reasons. And uh, with a lot of metrics for policy reasons, uh, for it's very practical reasons. So the, the, the real question is that uh, how, uh, a comparative uh, research can work or cannot work because I believe that you work a lot in Portugal, they actually based in Portugal, and I don't think it can be a really comparable with situation with Norway for a number of reasons. So how to address this, uh, the fact that we are in the same continent, also in the same for some of us in the UA, but actually with some different conditions but meteorological and of building and stock and so forth uh, that we combine and we talk together by different language. Thank you. I suggest we just take a couple more questions. I see Roberto um, has one. Would you like to ask us as well, Roberto? Yeah. 
So thank you to the three of you. It seems to, it seems to me that you are talking from the future, actually, because of the transportation. I've been living for 25 years in Rome, and Sid knows that that the transportation is very bad, especially the public ones. So, and on the other hand, also the or the the presentation of Tor regarding the heating, electrification, and the renewable. We are this objective that you already reached for the 2050, actually. So, um, and also we have the other targets and the other new change that is the electricity tariff change that you are also handling. So, uh, we have three um, regarding the tour presentation. We have these three targets the renewable uh, targets, the electrification of heating, and also a change. In, in energy behavior of households because of the change in your electricity tariff. And I want to ask especially to Tor, but also to the other speakers, um, some insights, some recommendation to handle this change. So to help households to, for one hand, to, to do this change, but also um, to, um, to help policymakers to make it easier for households. Great, thanks. I think we'll take one more question. Uh, is it, how do you say Akosh? Sorry if I didn't mispronounce your name. Yes, it's great, thanks, Akosh. So uh, I have a question related to the high levels of housing ownership in Norway. Well, do you see it as a, an obstacle uh, for alleviating poverty or uh, how do you perceive it? Great, thanks. Um, I, I think what we'll manage in the just we have a couple of minutes now is uh, something we can come back to in the last session also because then we have some time to share reflections. Um, before handing over to Tor, I will um, say something about the comparisons across contexts, for instance, Norway and Portugal. I think um, what's interesting actually came up uh, in Tor's talk that some of the things we're seeing in Norway um, will become relevant as more countries um, electrify different sectors and digitalize um, the electricity sector in the same way that Norway has done. And at least with smart meters, that's something that's already happening. Um, many countries are moving towards um, completing targets or in Italy, for instance, even into a second generation rollout. Um, yeah, and, and just to point point that it's not only that Norway is at the forefront of things, I actually found that what Lisbon experienced with the e-scooters is something that happened a year or two before the same debates came up in um, in different cities here. So it's very interesting also to learn across cities and these actors, of course, talk to each other. But Tor, would you like to add a few uh, closing reflections and then Thomas? Yeah, I, I really like that um, um, comparative uh, perspective or question from from uh, from both Luca and I think also Roberto. Um, I, I think these are the, the, the smart meters are coming everywhere, but in different forms and shapes. And, and the government or the national programs for doing this uh, sometimes it's left to the market and it's in different speeds. But but the, the, this change is uh, is. Um, on its way everywhere, I think, and and so avoiding some of the traps that might uh, that Norway might uh, go through um, is is I think quite quite important. Not Norway doesn't is not um, uh, it's it's one transition that we don't have here in Norway, which is um, decarbonisation of electricity sector, but. But that, that doesn't mean that it's not comparable, because we see the face in of, of renewables, we see the same system strains um, across electricity systems. Um, uh, so, so I think these this, um, lessons that Norway might provide uh, are, are highly useful, uh, hopefully, um, uh, in other contexts as well. Um, and of course, we're all, again, regulated and, and driven that these policy changes by that from the European level, even in Norway. Um, uh, so, so I think this is uh, how um, you, Roberto. You also asked about uh, advice for policy and uh, and tips for households. I, at least for the I'm a political scientist, and, and and at least for the policy development, I think what we see here is which is a, is a bit of a challenge is that um, consumer groups are, are and, and voices of consumer groups are not sufficiently included in the policy process. 
uh, and that is a real challenge. And, and so, so securing at least that within in other other policy development and, and tariff designs so is, I think, important to, to bring to other jurisdictions as well. It's just one thing. Thomas, do you want to add some closing thoughts? Yeah, sure. I mean, I uh, I enjoy the question as well. Uh, one that I guess haven't been um, touched upon yet was this. Uh, someone asked about how to think about time, and uh, and um, one very interesting thing about the Norwegian experience, uh, which is definitely one to be learned from uh, for other countries, is the whole kind of electrification of. Um, of transport basically which has come quite far uh, but uh, which i guess also illustrates some of the challenges of shifting temporal um, patterns of uh, mobility uh, shifting the loads from that over to the electricity system and kind of thinking about uh, that uh, in terms of how we manage the the energy system how we manage the uh, and that feeds into the question of the households as well so and and uh, the whole thing that thor talked about with uh, with tariffs and so on and so forth and uh, I, we're probably doing a lot of things semi wrong semi right i don't know but we're we're kind of threading the water at least to uh, to an extent that i think will be will be interesting to others as well Great, thanks. I see Harriet has a question and I've made note of it uh, because it's about micromobility and I want to say several things about social spatial uh, um, inclusion and about metrics uh, with a good example from Bergen, but uh, I'll save it for the third uh, session. Um, so we'll, um, we'll conclude this session here. All right, welcome back everyone for the final session of our module from the Norway Hub. We have a presentation by the training group. That's Vasiles, Agos, Rodrigo, and Miguel. And uh, they'll give a 15 minute talk on this question that we've assigned. What urban scale metrics can enable energy poverty alleviation in digitization for low carbon transition? So it's quite related to the theme uh, that we've just had uh, a hands-on workshop on. And then, at the end, uh, Thomas, uh, Tor and I will each spend about five minutes um, reflecting on the policy relevance of uh, the kind of uh, work that we've been discussing in this hub. So with that, I will hand over to our training group. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hello again, everyone. So as introduced by Siddharth, our group was tasked with uh, um, opening the conversation, opening the conversation about urban scale metrics that can enable energy poverty alleviation. Um, as a brief introduction, we tried and designed a, a brief a scheme to explain something that we already discussed <clears throat> earlier in the in the workshop, uh, the associated risks. Uh, of energy infrastructure digitization for low carbon, carbon emission, which is basically uh, leaving people behind, leaving groups of people behind uh, in, the, in the face of uh, energy poor. Um, so exacerbating disparities. Um, so for the, so how can we, uh, can you move on to the next? Uh, okay, so how can, how can and then the next metrology help us to reverse this process or to include um, the the energy poor in the in the digitization process in the low carbon emission progression or transition how can metrology help us design a more inclusive and fair digitization process process so we approach the question of the risks of the digi digitization for a low carbon energy infrastructure from a rather global perspective. Um, and we listed five key points that we actually uh, have touched upon during this workshop as well, uh, many times. 
Um, first uh, issue, or for the, for the first risk, we were thinking about the burden of carbon emissions of the digital industry itself that should be taken into account, um, especially although more developed localities are using digital tools to reduce local emissions. The digital infrastructure also requires substantial and exponentially growing energy input. So we think that the digitization of one locality should not come at the price of displacing emissions and its burden to other potentially less developed localities. Uh, just an example, uh, if the digital sector were a country, it could be the fifth largest emitter of carbon dioxide in the world, accounting for an estimated 3.8% of all emissions. Um, the second point that we came up with um, is yet again something that we have touched upon, creating new inequalities and exacerbating existing ones. Um, it is rather about the question of uh, who's being left behind or left out from the process uh, of uh, moving towards um, a low carbon emission society. We were thinking about the elderly ones, the low income families, unemployed ones, etc. cetera. Um, and the same issue is valid for accessing smart solutions in transportation, not only for the heating sector. Um, just one example, uh, like uh, in Europe, 48% of the population has no digital skills at all with significant territorial differences. I would like to highlight here the East-West and the North-South divide in Europe. Uh, yet again, um, further information can be found in the Digital Economy and Society Index. And the third one uh, that we came up with is the environmental inequality versus, uh, versus poverty alleviation, because we are talking about in this workshop uh, about uh, moving towards a low carbon uh, society, but the policy goals might actually clash with um, alleviating uh, poverty or energy poverty. And actually, it actually has the risk of deepening geographical inequalities as well. I mean, in terms of selecting the policy goals and the policy tools as well. For example, where it's worth investing in low carbon infrastructure versus where energy poor live and so on. And the digitalization also has the potential risk of undervaluing low tax solutions that cannot necessarily be digitally measured or uh, mapped. The fourth point is about the nature of data and the question of data ownership and data governance as well, because it might actually carry the risk of commodifying sensitive data and, uh, and it brings up quite many questions about data privacy and, um, and it actually carries the risks of creating monopolies um, or, it, or the data can be used for authoritative and unethical purposes, et cetera, especially because we're working with sensitive data. Um, and the fifth point that we came up with is yet again a quite global perspective, the resources of low, car low carbon uh, technologies, for example, um, the materials that we use for different um, technological solutions might actually create a local pollution uh, where um, the output of the move towards a low carbon economy is not like, um, how would I say, uh, enjoyed. And uh, when it comes to the metrics, we all know that uh, energy poverty is a multidimensional concept that it is not easily captured by a single indicator. For this reason, so far, a suite of indicators which should be viewed and used in combination exist. Um, those are four primary and 24 secondary indicators, such as the inability to keep home adequately warm, arrears on utility bills, uh, substandard housing, the low absolute energy expenditure, or the high share of energy expenditure in income. Mainly based on these 28 metrics, citywide, nationwide, as well as EU-wide projects or programs have uh, developed to alleviate energy poverty. A few examples is, uh, for example, the Nottingham City Council's program to eliminate the E, F, and G EPC rated homes occupied by energy poor households by 2025. Or, uh, for example, in Greece, a nationwide program is a saving at home first program and the second program, which uh, incentivizes renovations. At uh, the EU level, 
There are a lot of uh, projects, like just to mention a few, the NPOR, the COMAC, the PARAPOR, and many others. <clears throat> Uh, so we have been talking about the low carbon digital energy transition and we should uh, keep in mind that it should also be sustainable, inclusive and fair. So the risks that ACOS previously mentioned, we need to understand them and how they impact the energy poor. So today we brought a, uh, a bit of a challenge here, that is to brainstorm innovative indicators that uh, can be based on uh, current and emerging trends. So in the first place, we have the energy performance certificates that are evolving and they are providing inputs for innovative metrics. So you can see the image below that's from a project called uh, Extendo that uh, future energy performance certificates will have a, a smart readiness indicator. They will focus on comfort, on the real energy consumption, on outdoor air pollution and many other aspects that we can use to devise new metrics. And these will be uh, huge databases for buildings. Also, smart metering is spreading across consumers. And from this, we'll have a lot of data that will enable us to understand who is consuming energy, when, for example, we can uh, extrapolate winter and uh, summer energy consumption here, and uh, at what times and why they are not consuming. Uh, next slide, please. So a few more emerging trends, concepts, approaches. That, uh, that are starting to become important and for which uh, we need new metrics to understand their impact on energy poverty. So the Renovation Wave Initiative from the European Commission that aims to double current energy renovation rates of buildings. So this is, uh, is, is normally seen as a national wide metric, the percentage of buildings that is renovated each year. But in here, I think it's important and from what we discussed as a group, that uh, this is uh, calculated at the city scale, so we understand which areas are being renovated, which areas are not being renovated, which uh, buildings, uh, according to their age, to their topology, are being renovated. And also to understand the social impacts of this renovation, for example, leading to gentrification that we spoke a, a lot before, and also to the concept of uh, renovations, where people have to live their buildings because they are renovated. Uh, another concept is the positive energy districts, where uh, uh, in a district or neighborhood, energy is consumed in a very efficient way, and uh, uh, the energy production at local scale or uh, close by actually surpasses the consumption. And for this, we also need to understand uh, where these trends are emerging at city scale, uh, which neighborhoods are becoming uh, closer to the, these 100% positive energy districts, how far they are in that uh, roadmap, let's say, uh, how much they are uh, supporting uh, the building sides and how much they are supporting the renewal side, what's the flexibility of consumption of the different users, and much more that we can explore and try to devise metrics from uh, this concept. Linking to these also the prosumers and the energy communities concepts, where where we need to understand uh, uh, how much energy is being produced in the city, in the different areas. Who is producing that energy? Is uh, the renewable energy communities that are appearing, uh, how are they spread according to neighborhoods, for example? For We can have one area that is becoming with uh, where energy communities are blooming and other areas that uh, we don't see this activity. So we need to map that. We need to create a metric at city scale that uh, allows to understand these differences. And there's also something here about the uh, ownership of these uh, technologies. So we understand who is being left out and who is participating in these new approaches. Finally, linking to transport poverty, we have the 15-minute city con uh, concept that can also be derived as a, a metric. It, uh, and one example exists in Lisbon of a project that tries to do this where they, for each uh, civil parish, they see how far along is it becoming uh, a 15-minute city. So what is missing in, in this uh, area, so everything that the citizen needs is close by. And some final thoughts to conclude. Uh, we think that, uh, as a group, uh, we should define monitoring indicators and statistical data collection. 
because as stated in the clean energy package for all Europeans, it is obligatory for all member states of the European Union to set quantifiable indicators-based targets on energy poverty mitigation at national level. The political commitment required is also highlighted there. Defining specific monitoring indicators and data collection to support progress measuring will re result in effective implementation of the measures. Moreover, we need uh, improvements on current metrics and measurement systems, which can also play an important role in energy poverty alleviation. The processes should ensure public's input so for a more accurate and uh, robust metrics, where citizens feel welcome to engage with this. <clears throat> we also think that we are in need of more compatible data. Collection and consolidation of large compatible data sets would create a new databases for policy makers and enable them to deduce direct implications of certain policy decisions and conduct, conduct excuse me, scenario and sensitivity analysis. This includes the enforcement of data provision and in some cases the prior provision of uh, measurable equipment countries that lack sufficient infrastructure and equipment. By surpassing uh, the existing measurement challenges, more appropriately tailored practical action can then be developed to address um, active energy poverty alleviation barriers associated with limited databases, coverage and uh, disaggregated resolutions. And one final thing, not to forget, digitalization should reflect on the geographies of diverse realities. And otherwise, inequalities will uh, deepen it. Thank you. Thanks. What an interesting talk, really collaborative as well. Um, can you perhaps um, take away the slides? We can see each other. Great. So any questions for um, Marcelles, Agos, Rodrigo, and Miguel? While people are gathering their thoughts, I have a question for the group to get you started. Um, you, I, I know that you worked um, together quite closely to prepare this. And I, I know others are probably curious also to hear what kind of backgrounds did each of you bring into this and how did you use that in order to respond to the statement? Well, uh, may I start? <clears throat> I'm an environmental um, physicist. My specialization is on the building environment. So it's about um, thermal comfort, energy efficiency, and that uh, stuff. Um, what I tried to bring into this presentation um, is um, the data collection uh, discrepancies. I mean, we have faced that, um, we see in our research that um, data limitations, um, let's say, uh, bring a barrier when we try to measure, let's say, uh, energy poverty. This is the main topic I, I brought into the presentation. Yeah, I can go next. next. Uh, so I'm an architect and urban planner. I'm currently uh, taking a master's degree in sustainable urban planning. Uh, so, uh, but the, the mainly, the main thing that uh, highlighted for me itself it was the 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 way that the measurements or the metrology can can be um can work both sides can can be inclusive or exclusive or the way the data can be um you know structured in the way that you know can serve a, a purpose and that can be risky for many reasons and for many um you know ranges of groups and, and stuff so that is the main the main thing that um i tried and and, and focus on the on the subject let's say the metrology can indeed be a tool but it can be used in both ways as i guess all the other tools so that's something to to be aware of well um i mostly 
brought in um, the challenges section, basically. <laughs> uh, I'm working at the University of Helsinki on a project uh, that is about um, the unequal burden of air pollution and its links to energy and transport poverty. Um, and basically the key thoughts perhaps that I brought in, I, I'm, oh, I'm from Hungary, by the way, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the key thoughts perhaps that I brought in were the uh, east-west, north-south divide uh, of inequalities and um, another like quite important modification for me at least was basically the data sources uh, because we uh, mentioned that we need more compatible data because I think at least in my project we have like a lot of data available like we were, we're working with like incredibly huge data set, but the data sets are oftentimes not compatible, um, are in different ownership as well with energy providers, with, with the city, with the, I don't know, um, like environmental institutes and you have to gather these and it's expensive and it like really, how would I say, poses an obstacle to actually provide meaningful um, research and, and policy tools to, to improve the situation. So I think those were the key ideas. So and to finalize, I'm an environmental engineer and a PhD student at Sense FCTNOV in the topics of energy and climate. And uh, I think uh, I tried to bring to this discussion these new emerging concepts that are appearing and how they interlink with energy poverty, the risks that they might bring. And I think we had a very good uh, conversation, discussion between us about uh, the, the risks and these concepts and uh, the kind of uh, metrics that can be devised to follow up on these, the type of uh, databases that are available. So it, yeah, it was a very nice exercise that we had between us for. Thank you. Fantastic. Any questions for the group? I have one if, if no one else does. Um, I was just curious to hear your thoughts about the ways in which the energy performance certificates would need to, to evolve, um, how we could increase their usefulness as a metric underpinning all of this. Just because reflecting on the UK, at least, um, there's quite a lot of problems with the underlying assumptions that are made in the, the system that underpins it. So particularly where people use the, um, there's like a full model and a reduced model. Often the reduced model is used because it's easier to, to process in the field and uh, the calculation afterwards. But it means that the results it produces on the energy efficiency of a property are quite flawed. Um, and the recommendations it leads to often aren't the best match for uh, for the property in terms of the building fabric, but also the occupants as well. So it'd be curious to hear your own reflections from your particular countries and uh, kind of on a comparative basis too. Well, um, if I may, if I go first, I would say that we need to, to include thermal comfort into the EPCs. Apart from the energy rating, the energy efficiency, we also need to, uh, to include the, that information uh, regarding thermal comfort of the occupants. This is a main point I see as a lacking, you know, uh, a missing information. Uh, this would uh, give um, a more, uh, an overall view about how occupants feel or uh, they, 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 they understand their thermal comfort. And of course, you know, there, there's a discussion about how each of us feel thermal comfort and there are gender, um, uh, you know, the, the girls feel different uh, than boys, for example. So it's a whole new world for this, a new whole research for this, but, um, in one word, I would say thermal comfort. 
can also add that um, to use uh, real energy consumption instead of just uh, theoretical uh, calculations and this will lead to better recommendations and these recommendations need to be follow up so uh, at least in portugal uh, nowadays much most, most people uh, uh, asks for an energy certificate because they, they need one to sell the house or to rent. So it's just a bureaucracy and it's just time consuming and uh, annoying for people. But uh, there should be a better mechanisms to actually implement the recommendations because even as they are today, the certificates give uh, useful information and uh, useful recommendations, but most of the times they are ignored. Yeah, and also um, something that we brought on the presentation itself, uh, the the importance of uh, the context in which the you know the the scenario that the country, uh, which involves not only the the climate, but also other aspects such as co culture as well. So as as Mercedes was talking about, also play a role that the. the you know, the, the culture approach on uh, thermal con uh, comfort, for example. Uh, so in Brazil, we feel that, for example, we, we can feel comfortable uh, living in a certain way or with uh, a certain type of uh, residential thermal comfort that is not reality or that's not applicable here in Europe. And the same thing, if we consider a, a um, metrology that is developed here in Europe may not be applicable for, you know, other other uh, continents and stuff. So the context is also very relevant to the, the whole process, actually. I see a couple of raised hands. Um, it's uh, Adam and then Luca. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, that was a really interesting presentation. Um, kind of taking what Harriet had said a little bit further, this whole EPC, um, the certification system, uh, there is a paper from the UK that says that, uh, that really calls into question the whole quality of, of the data. Um, and this is something that I find particularly concerning. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, how you would address that. I think the paper says something like 40% of landlords are not compliant. Uh, and then out of those that are compliant, something like 30% of the uh, certificates are incorrect. And it kind of also echoes a little bit my own personal experience selling a property some years ago now in the UK and having to get an EPC in order to sell and being told by the plumber, well, we'll just put a, a thermostat on the wall because it doesn't need to be connected to anything. Just having it on the wall will mean that you go up a step on, on the EPC and it will mean that the property is more sellable. Um, you know, the point behind these things, uh, quality control, really, the quality of the data. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about that and how you can see EPCs in the future being perhaps more um, uh, reliable, that's the word, yeah. Thanks, Adam. I suggest you take Luca as well and then take a response together. Right. Uh, so my, my question is on uh, on the metrics and, and actually what uh, Vasilius mentioned, the thermal comfort, which is something that um, we've been looking here in Croatia also. Uh, we're doing quite a bit of projects where we're doing home visits. So we're actually we're doing like simple energy advising. So we go into people's homes. Uh, take down the energy consumption data and as of recently we're trying to measure how warm they feel and it's a very elusive uh, thing to, to measure. Um, so my question would be are there any methodologies that have been developed something that's uh, uh, where you could point me to or just any any experience sharing uh, on on that because it's it's, it really is the key the key question and the question is also how, how to how to measure it is it just temperature is it temperature in all rooms is it temp is it humidity so there's there's a bunch of questions around that i know that there are some projects where um, some field uh, data collection situations where they 
actively measure uh, temperature and then try to compare what was the temp temperature profile before and after. Um, but I would like to hear more if, if anybody, if Basilius or anyone here has to share about that. Yeah, that's true. Um, so far in most of the projects, um, I have uh, seen um, thermal comfort is uh, measured by surveys. Um, there are uh, some surveys where they ask, how do you feel uh, when the, the, the window is open? You know, things like that. There isn't any, um, any robust method to, to um, calculate, let's say, thermal comfort. Uh, there is much space for improvement on this. However, of course, um, there are some um, instruments that could, uh, let's say, measure thermal comfort. But again, measurements from what the occupant feel, there's a gap between these. Um, as part of Adam's uh, question, I would say that, uh, yes, we need more data in order to make EPCs more, um, uh, to, to bring them into reality. What, what does it mean that um, an EPC is rated E or G or F? The thing is that how much energy do we consume and how do we feel inside the house? Are we cold? Then we are, uh, then we are poor, let's say. We are energy poor, excuse me. We need, there, again, there's much space for improvement, both in the EPC measurement, rating, and uh, how this uh, idea is conceptualized. Um, it's a good point that we need, uh, it's a good start, it's a good beginning that we need EPCs in order to sell a house, to rent a house, as this shows something, it shows the energy consumption. Uh, but uh, from what I can say, it's not what it, uh, to make it, uh, to put it in, in politely, uh, we need more, we need more data on this. I see we're running uh, out of time, so I'm going to ask Shuao to uh, maybe if you have a comment, Shuao, to the group. Did I answer to your questions? Because we're a lot of... I can also skip my, my comment here because during the week we'll be addressing this for sure, uh, so I can, I can leave it. Great. So any closing comments from the, the trainee group, if you want to add something? I know there were several questions. Uh, maybe I could just add to what Vasilis was saying uh, that regarding Lucas' questions, uh, one thing that may help us with uh, uh, lowering the subjectivity of the service and the, you know how people feel is to work with actual um, you know uh, physical um, you know. Um, uh, measurement things uh, because uh, there is a stress to the body relates re related to the thermal comfort so if we if we face the subject under the the lens of uh, for example medical um, conditions and and how the, the body is actually negatively affected by uh, a over um, overly cold uh, house or uh, you know high levels of humidity and stuff. So maybe that's a, uh, uh, a way for us to have a more um, reliable analysis over the, the thermal uh, comfort, comfort. And also something similar to answer Adam's uh, question that uh, we need some sort of standardization on the, on the, you know, the, the measurement as well. The, the metrology related to the the EPCs, um, but that's but that's something that is tricky because <clears throat> at the same time we, we need to take into consideration the particularities. So that's a standardization based on what? So based on um, climate or culture. So that that that's the tricky part, I guess. The the tricky part of the process. That's not quite an answer, but. I guess it's a way of 
approach it as well. Great, thanks. Do others have anything to add? I was just thinking about something that is also starting to appear that's the minimum uh, standards for buildings requirements in some countries. So this can be something that pushes the, the performance certificates to, to work better because when people sell a, bu a building, they need to sell it at uh, C class or a uh, B class instead of what currently it is. So it can be something that brings to relevance this, uh, this tool. Great. Thanks. Then I think uh, perhaps we'll move into the, the closing round of uh, statements from each of the trainers. Um, I'll spend three, four minutes each. Um, I wanted to reflect on how researchers can contribute to mainstreaming energy poverty metrics in digitization. And, um, and I wanted to draw an example from a project called Roles, Responsive Organizing for Low Emission Societies, where we work with uh, different uh, sectors that are shifting towards low carbon infrastructure um, in medium sized cities across Europe. So we look at solar energy in Brighton in the UK, at, um, at smart electric meters in Trento in Italy and at uh, mobility transitions in Bergen in Norway. And, um, and just in terms of what that looks like, I'll uh, say a couple of things from the Bergen example that uh, we've platformed the conversation around mobility transitions, uh, holding things like seminars and workshops, uh, both um, public ones and closed ones, um, where we invite uh, mobility experts, but also people broadly interested in energy transitions, also people generally interested in moving around their own city um, into a public space for dialogue and debate, and then also hold closed doors uh, workshops with the municipality itself on, for instance, the topic of, uh, of developing car-free zones, um, not only in the city center, Bergen has one in a suburb called Molenpreis, but also in the suburbs. And this has come up uh, in a few different ways during the session or during the whole module that uh, it really matters what kind of place, what legacy it has, what sociocultural context you're in, because the suburbs don't typically have the same context as a city center in terms of space to walk about. There's a lot more dependence on cars. And so um, how do you open up that space for discussing what it could look like to have a mobility transition, what it means for those people? And um, that's helped us to, or that's led us to having a number of uh, small scale surveys in different places actually where people have uh, m m sort of uh, transfer hubs uh, when they might shift from one mode to another, um, doing sort of small questionnaires even on the street, which has been really difficult with the pandemic, but we've tried ways using QR codes to get people to maybe respond online instead, but catching them during particular kinds of activities of mobility, whether by car or by different public transport modes. And then it's also meant engaging with people through things like focus groups and expert interviews and to get into many of the very detailed lived experiences of what a mobility transition means to very diverse stakeholders, to somebody who commutes by ferry every day, to somebody who lives in the city center, to somebody who has three children and school drop-offs. Um, so there's a number of methods, but also I think uh, the last thing I want to say is that being able to create that sort of space itself is a quite vital function that uh, researchers, especially working in energy, social science, um, can contribute by actually bringing to light things that there might be a knowledge need for, ways in which policymakers themselves might be limited and face constraints. They're often really busy people, the ones who are doing good stuff, they're in demand for everything from European projects to local plans and uh, implementing things and holding urban cafes and consultations. So um, that's, that's one way that uh, that research can both help develop, but also um, institutionalize the kinds of metrics we might need as digitization happens. So with that over to, uh, to Thomas and then to Tor. Yeah, thanks a lot. And first, just uh, thank everyone for a lot of interesting input. Um, so from my perspective, um, so I think we're dealing here with a set of highly complex issues, uh, you know, energy transitions, mobility transitions, and uh, 
yeah, transforming urban spaces more broadly. Um, and, uh, you know, from listening to the discussions today, uh, it is clear, I think, that there's some inherent sort of challenges here to creating uh, metrics, you know, taking the complex reality and tra translating it into uh, numerics that you're supposed to act upon. And, you know, on a very basic sort of social science level, you can say that then you know, what you count what you measure it ends up sort of producing the world that you actually uh, live in to a certain extent. And uh, just to say here that uh, just through that point alone, I think this is one of the most policy relevant fields there is because, uh, you know, um, uh, thinking about what these metrics could be and uh, trying to produce them is such a political act in itself. And I so, from listening to the discussions today, I think it's very promising. Uh, there's been this historical tendency, I guess, to measure in terms of technical and economic efficiency, perhaps. Um, and what we've seen here today is the strong need, I guess, to sort of zoom out a bit from that and to uh, look at much broader implications of uh, uh, of uh, um, transitions and rethinking sort of the metrics, what they could be with stuff like justice and poverty in mind. And I have a kind of uh, uh, challenge, I guess, that I would would uh, would like to point to. So, so this expansion, I mean, we've heard a lot now about uh, in the presentation and also in the, the discussion following it. Um, there's been a lot of calls here now for kind of a data standardization and data um, harmonization and data, yeah, you know, uh, bigger data, better data. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I'm torn here because on the one hand, I really see the point, I really see the need from a research perspective for those things. On the other hand, um, I, I would say that if we at this point now, then then uh, then move in that direction of standardization uh, of massive data, then we also uh, put a massive responsibility on our shoulders in terms of thinking about uh, when we standardize now, we <laughs> sort of lock in a description of the world for, I don't know, for a long time. Statistics Norway have been around for hundred years and uh, and they're constantly faced now with the choices they made you know, 60 years ago about how to describe the world. So I'm kind of in light of the discussions today, I think it's, it's pretty interesting to reflect on some of the things that we maybe struggle a bit to quantify. So power relations and uh, community, trust, uh, you know, uh, the non-technological stuff, uh, and, and also kind of think about how to, um, how to combine uh, our focus here on, on data and uh, the easily quantifiable metrics with, I guess, other types of metrics, which are also needed to, um, to ensure an, an a just kind of a transition here. So that would be, that would be then uh, uh, one uh, uh, thing saying that, yes, we're super policy relevant, but on the other hand, uh, think carefully about, um, how to mobilize that policy relevance in kind of uh, producing new stories about the world as we uh, move forward. Okay, and with that, I, I will hand uh, over to Tur. Yeah, so, so you say, think carefully about the data you ask for, <laughs> I guess. I, th I think, um, thank you so much for, for these uh, fruitful discussions. It's really food for thought that I'm, I'm going to bring uh, I guess I am home, but I'll, I'll uh, keep them here and and um, and keep thinking about these uh, these dimensions that you have brought into into my mind as well. I, I was just kind of wanting to take a little bit of a step back, I think, from from the from the metrics before before ending there. Perhaps um, it it strikes me that when we're talking about these things, if it, digitization. Uh, decarbonization they're all they're all really we have to remember that these are transitions there are changes and with changes there are going to be winners and losers and and so we have we have 
we have some objectives and they are, the, the, the main overarching objectives can be often summed up now in uh, of today. It, it cannot be summed up as in, uh, in a zero carbon economy and, and those kind of terms. And so, so we have to, we know that we have to end up there. And with, with bringing in energy poverty and all the social aspects and, and dimensions into, into the transition, I think that's, that's key to remember that these transitions, they, are, they have social implications. Uh, that, that is lacking or very often, it's coming, but I think it's still lacking very much in, in discussion. We see it more and more in the research, uh, less at least in Norway in, in policy. But we have some examples for the phasing in of, of high numbers of electric vehicles, providing um, quite quite big discussions, fruitful discussions, important discussions about who can purchase these vehicles, who cannot. Um, and we have the same in, 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 in other parts of the transition with wind power. It's been a high, high level controversy in Norway. Who, the people who are impacted by these changes are not the same as the system level benefits that they bring. Um, and we have had road toll protests, same thing basically. And these are measures that put in place to, to deal with, uh, deal with uh, mobility issues and decolonization of mobility that provides um, poverty dimensions in people's lives. Um, and so we have these two, two kind of, this seems to be a discussion of, of uh, where the effectiveness of the, these transitions are, are held against the, the inclusive aspects or the social dimensions of these transitions. And, and then we, but we need to think also, I think that they are interconnected. So when, when there are too many, um, local or non-local um, uh, impacts uh, and favorable impacts of, of, of these uh, changes, there will be backlash. And we have seen these through the three examples I've mentioned. Um, so they also can um, lead to uh, challenges for the effectiveness and the actual transition themselves. So I think those two, two, two sides of the, the flip sides of the coin almost. Uh, and energy poverty is, is, is uh, smack in the middle of this, I think. So moving on to the policy measures and the calls for metrics and more data, I think the, the more data is, is, um, is crucial. Uh, we need more data. I think Thomas's encouragement to, to think well before you ask for the, what, what data you ask for is, is good to keep in mind. Um, but we also know that we will get more data. We, we will be overwhelmed by, by more data. We have census, we have apps we have we have it's it's really the access to data will be or at least the existence of data will be um will be very present in, in the future uh, and also these this smart meters and digitization of the of the uh, electricity sectors in, in uh, will, will be provide us with perhaps at least for the flexibility uh, discussion that I've been trying to push up here, it's, it's going to be easier to measure some of these, some of the aspects at least with, with the, the data that, uh, that the same digitization process will provide. Um, so, so I think then it's, it's all to the policy measure. I think really uh, that um, inclusive processes are key. Um, so, when we design the, the policies, evidence-based policies that we have, uh, we'll get the data for, hopefully, um, at least in some other aspects, there will be uh, important holes and the data will be biased. But, but with this, uh, I still think that the policy design and the policy measures design, they are very technocratic, uh, very often. They tend to be designed within the a regulator or, or the, or the um, um, energy agencies in respective countries and they do not always take into consideration these uh, the, the social aspects that we have been talking about today I think so so increasing the, the well creating inclusive processes with more uh, perhaps higher legitimacy of the out, output of these policy processes I think I would I would point to that as, as uh, a, a crucial aspect that would should not escape this group. So I'll, I think I'll leave it at that to not overstep my time too much.